transforming the Marine Corps to compete with China. Uh, that's our subject today on the military in Hawaii. And we have uh, Lieutenant General Emerson Gardner. Uh, and uh, welcome to the show, uh, Lieutenant General Gardner. Oh, thank you for having me today, Jay. Please call me Emo. Okay, Emo it is. Um, so there's a lot of things changing in the world, and certainly that starts with the Pacific, which is the title of our show, but we'll also talk about Ukraine, which is, um, you know, the, uh, the, the frustration, the outrage of the moment. Um, so let's talk about the changes in the Pacific first. Let's talk about, um, you know, uh, how the, the Pacific is in a new kind of dynamic, what kind of dynamic that is. Is it a defense dynamic? Um, is it an economic dynamic? Uh, is it part of a global dynamic? And how does that affect the view of the Marine Corps and the military and dealing with the challenges of the Pacific? Well, of course, um, the Pacific has changed greatly because uh, the, the biggest actor in the, in the region, China, has uh, changed um, economically and also uh, with regard to their ambitions, or at least their enacting their ambitions. So what we see is a, a more expansive China uh, that has uh, is trying to resolve grievances uh, from the uh, past uh, hundred years of history or two hundred years of history, uh, and 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 making aggressive moves and the out uh, outward from its uh, its own coastline. Uh, the theater. Um, is uh, it's always been a maritime theater um, managed, of course, by the commander of uh, Indo PACOM. Uh, but um, the main player here uh, it, of China has become much more of a maritime actor. Uh, it's become very active in the South China Sea, uh, has actually created uh, islands and put uh, military facilities on them, um, has um, essentially taken over Hong Kong, has changed the laws. It's not officially uh, part of China, uh, it, totally integrated, uh, but it's just a matter of time. There are recent uh, laws and uh, much more heavy handedness in Hong Kong. And of course, they've always had the intent of bringing Taiwan back into um, China, China proper. So that's been the background. Uh, we've seen steady growth on that. Uh, our U.S. grand strategy has been to um, has been to treat the threat of China as the pacing factor for the United States, and so that we would uh, draw down our involvement in the Middle East, um, also uh, reduce our uh, resources and forces in Europe, so that we could then concentrate them on this uh, Pacific threat. So what you see. Uh, now, with uh, what's happened recently here with Ukraine, is that's upset that balance. It's not doesn't seem like it's going to be appropriate to withdraw from Europe. If anything, we're already putting thousands of troops in as part of NATO, uh, and you know, given another two or three months, we'll see what the permanent posture change is. But clearly, we're not going to be able to draw down and take resources from our European engagement and put that towards the Pacific. We're gonna to have to increase resources. Then Lieutenant General Dave Berger, who was the commanding general of Marine Forces Pacific, is out here involved in all the war planning, um, really began to take a hard look at how the, the Marine Corps was constituted, how it acted. He was transferred from here back to the Marine Corps Combat Development Center and then became commandant uh, in the summer of 2019. In that summer, he put out some planning guidance in which he said uh, his number one focus for his four-year tour was what he calls Force Design 2030. And it is to adapt and change the focus of the Marine Corps from being a amphibious force and readiness oriented on uh, all global threats to one that's primarily focused on supporting naval, the naval campaign in the Pacific. So um, he is, he began doing a lot of analyses and this program he has uh, turned over. Uh, it's on, 
a lot of analysis about force on force with China, a lot of war gaming, uh, and uh, came to the conclusion that there needed to be significant changes in the Marine Corps, that we need to uh, lighten the Marine Corps, make it more agile. The concept, the operational concept that he sees is instead of the Marine Corps being um, oriented on large amphibious assaults in the Pacific, much as we saw in World War II, let's make the, um, the Marine Corps more of an arm of the, the maritime component, the naval component. Uh, let's equip the Marine Corps. What does the Navy actually need? The Navy needs precision fires, long range fires. It needs help in dominating the huge expanse of the Pacific. So the idea is we're off the East Coast of the, um, go into different uh, islands, islets inside the first island chain with forces that have long range precision fires. Um, missile batteries that can shoot 100 to 500 miles. And if you think about if you have, so let's say five to 10 of these islands and you put marine littoral forces out there on each of those islands, and then you draw a circle around each of the islands, when you get five or 10 of them and you combine all those circles, you can see that Marines can actually dominate a significant part of the sea space um, with uh, if they have the right sensors and they have the right uh, weapons to go in on on Chinese forces. So this then would free up the Navy to focus um, to cover more area. Basically, you have the naval component covering more area. So uh, to, to get there, um, we, we need things. We need more uh, longer range, more effective longer range weapons. We need uh, to be agile, you need to move forces around. Um, if, you, if we're that close to China, you can imagine it would be a very vulnerable area. And once you, you shoot a missile or fire uh, some kind of weapon, um, you put out a signature and you're gonna be, then become a target. So what you basically have to do is shoot, move, set up in a new place, shoot again, move again. So you need connectors, you need um, small amphibious ships to quickly offload forces to, that can do this kind of uh, shooting and then reload them, move to another place. You need helicopters that can also move those out there. So this mobility piece uh, is, becomes very important. Uh, the, the logistics of, of any of these operations in the Pacific um, because of the huge space and remoteness, uh, fuel becomes a really big problem. Uh, so you can, you can see that Marine Force will end up having to bring in bladders uh, to service uh, these uh, firing units, et cetera, and then move them after they shoot, et cetera. So this is the force you need. The, the, the General Berger said the, the Marines need to be in order to help the naval campaign. Well, how are we going to to do that. We need to start um, investing in designing new smaller amphibious ships that are less targeted. Uh, and and his, his idea is to divest uh, functions that we, we now have and capabilities in order to invest. So for example, he has uh, eliminated tanks from the Marine Corps inventory. Uh, he has uh, changed uh, all the artillery units, or basically almost all of them, to um, missile units. So instead of trucks hauling um, 155 millimeter um, artillery pieces, we're going to have um, missiles that can fire from the back of vehicles and even Humvees. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> he's going to make the Marine Corps smaller. Uh, he's cut the idea is we're focused on this single threat. Um, we, we don't really need infantry units as much as we need littoral units that are capable of, of, of this mobility and these long range fires. So he's, um, he foresees um, to generate the resources. In other words, make this change within the same budget top line uh, that the Marine Corps currently has 
Um, so it's going to reduce the size of the Marine Corps by about 12,000. So right now it's around, it was when we started this two years ago, it was around 186,000. And it's going to go down to about 174,000. And he's getting there by reducing uh, about 108 aircraft. Um, in other words, making squadrons from 16 aircraft each to 10, uh, getting rid of tanks, uh, the artillery pieces, et cetera. Uh, and so this is a at least five year uh, and as long as 10 year uh, project to kind of to get to this objective force. Um, but he wants to he, he's trying to speed this along because um, the general consensus is that the threat to China is in after 2025 to 2030. We don't really think we have a lot of time to do this. We need to get on with it. Well, you know, uh, uh, read about um, long range missiles, um, naval assets that China has been building. I don't think they have a Navy like our Navy, but they're certainly trying to build a lot of Navy assets and and uh, for that matter, long range missiles. And so it, it, it just as, a, you know, a citizen civilian rather than a senior Marine officer, <laughs> I would just guess that, you know, we have to focus on that because that's where they're focusing. Uh, at the end of the day, it really is defense. You know, the U.S. is always, you know, concerned about defense more than anything. And, and uh, if they're doing long range missiles and building, you know, big ships, and uh, capable of crossing the Pacific, then we have to be able to meet them on that. So it would seem to me that uh, we, we better be sure that we have the naval you know, equipment ready to go. And I, and, I, and I think what I heard you saying was that that's where we're working. We may be reducing the size of the Marine Corps, but we're probably increasing the, the, uh, the hardware in the Navy and, and the weaponry in the Navy and the long range aspect of the Navy, no? That, that, that's exactly right. It'll be, you know, in terms of end strength, the, the Marine Corps will be smaller, but for this particular mission, it's gonna be much more powerful. Uh, we don't have uh, missiles that shoot 500 miles now, and uh, we don't really have the capability. But using, um, the, for example, the F-35 jets that we have, and which have a tremendous uh, sensing capability, you can go out and find targets, you can transmit that targeting information down to uh, missiles. The missiles then can target that ship or whatever it is you're, is coming out. And, um, and also can put even these new island bases that uh, the, the Chinese have constructed in the South China Sea, um, you know, you can put those under threat. Uh, and the idea is we're basically expanding the Navy with the Marine Corps. Uh, and, and we are a naval force and part of it on there. Uh, the only controversy on this, uh, uh, on this within, within the Marine Corps and, and people that have looked at this thing, it's been, it's been wholly embraced by Congress and is very uh, well thought of as innovative and bold. Uh, and General Berger certainly gets a lot of credit there. The only controversy is that um, it's a, almost a singular focus. Uh, the Marine Corps never really had a singular focus before. We've always been a, a global force. You know, we're we're doing uh, V twenty two operations in Africa, and we have we were of course in the whole all of the Iraq and Afghanistan thing. And now we're really we're still going to be able to do some of that, but we're giving up those extra capabilities to focus on this. And so that's a bit of a risk uh, historically, uh, but um, one that the commandant feels is is worth taking. So you don't see now in the in Ukraine situation, you don't there, there's no Marine involvement. Uh, that's traditionally an army um, uh, theater. Uh, but also, if you think that uh, while this is all going on in Ukraine, we need to kind of watch what's going on on the other side of the world and see if China is trying to take advantage of our focus on on Europe right now. And so yeah. the Marines stand ready here and are the other are the other fist, if you will. Well, the press has been full of that possibility, you know, that the Chinese have been uh, fairly arrogant about their moves in uh, Hong Kong and uh, against Taiwan and, and those islands you talked about. 
Um, they're they're very focused on that, and uh, and also the the possibility that somehow Vladimir Putin's adventures in Ukraine will encourage them. For example, logically, if he prevails in Ukraine, and he may do that, that makes the Chinese all the bolder, uh, all the bolder at doing the same kind of thing with respect to uh, Taiwan. Um, and so this theater is always important, isn't it? It's always important. And, and, and it, it, you always have to look and see what else is going on in the world to evaluate the risks and uh, the possibilities here. Absolutely. No, and, and absolutely correct. Whereas normally the Chinese are very um, outspoken about other countries respecting uh, territorial rights. Here we see Russia, you know, using, uh, you know, the old uh, old Russia concept, Russian empire concept on Ukraine. Uh, and that's not a lot different than, than China looking at Taiwan as part of China. So, you know, we need to go in there and you, know, you can see China making the argument that the, uh, they made it very clear that they're going to do everything possible to to get Taiwan back in. So it's just a matter of how are they going to do that? Is that going to happen peace, peacefully? So sort of two logs going down the river that just eventually converge. Um, you see that with all the business and uh, the air travel between the two, between Taiwan and China, et cetera. Or is it going to be just done forcefully, which is what um, Russia's doing in, in Ukraine? Um, then if you take that step one, think thought process one step further, you, we see how the world is reacting to Russia. We're not reacting to Russia with force on force. All the troop movements and everything else are in support, are bolstering the defenses of countries around Ukraine. And the primary uh, instruments being used to deter Putin are economic, diplomatic, um, and, um, and, they, and they seem to be, they seem quite strong and they seem to be effective. I think China is watching that as well. Um, of course, they're a much larger, much more important economic force. Uh, but they also have, they're also very vulnerable yeah. uh, to that. Well, uh, talking about Ukraine for a minute, that's what every, everybody's thinking about lately. Um, <clears throat> certainly Europe has changed in the past week, um, if not the past month. And um, Europe is afraid. The countries in the EU, the people in the EU are afraid. The people in NATO are afraid. Uh, that Putin is just uh, ramping up to do more, and that Ukraine is uh, is a part of a step transaction, and you know, and and that would seem his way of thinking: step transaction. You take this step, that step, and you gauge the result. It's it's slightly pathological, but um, you know, I suppose uh, we are, we we understand him better now after a few weeks of this. And what's interesting from I like to see it through your eyes. You know, you've had a long career in the Marine Corps. You've been concerned with national defense and readiness for how many decades? Um, and now you see a Cold War that you thought went away. We all thought went away and it didn't go away. And it's back and it's worse than it has been through our lifetimes, General. Um, we didn't we never saw this in all the years. Uh, after World War II. This is really unprecedented at all that time. And, and for a military man, you know, you must have a specific view of it because you have seen the Cold War. You've seen the, you know, the containment of Russia, uh, in, in a way, the fall of Russia. Uh, and now we have this. And it, it really, what it says is we had better um, think twice before we turn our backs on them. Uh, we'd better think twice before we let our guard down. Um, this is a time when, when America has to protect itself and the rest of the free world, more, more perhaps than we have in, in the past several decades. Well, of course, one, one of the, the big takeaways here is um, the Europeans themselves now get it. Germany has done a tremendous uh, change in policy. They've always I mean, longtime uh, members of NATO, of course, but they've always tread lightly uh, when it comes to Russia, necessarily. Um, but uh, and there was a lot of uh, doubt and uncertainty about where uh, they how they were going to deal with uh, Russia in this case. But now it's quite clear they 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 cut off the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. They have been uh, right there on all the sanctions. 
you have hundreds of thousands of Germans actually demonstrating in Berlin for stronger defense um, and spending, you know, up to the, the previous uh, NATO uh, goal of 2% of GDP. And uh, so we have to hope that it's too little too late. I think the real risk that uh, we are being very effective, I think, with these economic and di diplomatic measures, it's putting huge, um, you know, Putin has made some mistakes in how, how in his assumptions and on how fast this was all going to go and uh, how effective he's going to be. And so um, he's going to start feeling pressure. His uh, supporters, the oligarchs are now being sanctioned. Um, all of these uh, measures are, are going to start having an effect in, you know, on the population. He's going to feel pressure. Um, and I think he's going to have to limit his goals uh, in Ukraine. Uh, you know, he'll probably annex uh, some of the eastern portion there, which will allow him um, you know, direct access to the Black Sea from Russia. But then he'll probably be willing to accept some sort of Ukrainian government, as long as it's, um, you know, not, uh, not is much more neutral. He wants more of a, like a, a Switzerland kind of government or something between uh, Russia and, uh, and NATO. But well, how he gets there, I think the big change for us is, um, comes back to this theater. We, we see how much has to be done to be able to deal with China. And we have to, to um, develop the forces and invest in the forces to go do that. And um, right now, we're going to do diverting. I mean, even the Democrats today uh, on the Hill, we're talking about a 10 to $20 billion supplemental right now this year uh, to, for Ukraine. Well, how long, you know, how long are we going to be able to do that? And where's that money? That is money that we were hoping to invest in against China. Well, I mean, what it, what it comes down to is uh, this is a message that we have to be in both uh, theaters. We have, yes. to, we have to beef it up in uh, the Pacific. We are also, I mean, I really think this changes uh, uh, American policy and American defense policy in Europe. Uh, if they're scared, we should be, you know, appropriately concerned. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, a, a couple of days ago, um, Putin said that, don't forget, we are a nuclear power, which, which is really rattling saber, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we haven't heard those kinds of words in a long time. And I said to myself, why, why now? What is this? I'll give you a theory, and I wonder your thought about it. Um, I think, although the U.S. and for that, that matter, Western Europe has said they don't want to put boots on the ground in Ukraine, I think his uh, uh, escalation uh, of the attack um, does suggest to a lot of people that from a humanitarian point of view, maybe we have to reconsider that simply to save lives on a humanitarian basis. People are dying and will continue to die in large numbers. And so his concern, right or wrong, is that uh, the Western Europeans may think more and more about putting boots on the ground in Western Ukraine. Uh, and possibly the U.S., although, you know, the president has made it clear he's not going to do that. Um, it's it's a, an issue that could be considered again if things get worse. And so I think his Putin's, Putin's mentioning his nuclear capability, his threat is a way of saying, um, don't put boots on the ground, because if you do that, we're going to have a nuclear war. Uh, and, and it was an anticipation. It was a, a, one of those step transaction moves. Uh, as part of a, a whole, uh, um, you know, long, long plan that he's engaged in. What do you think? I think that um, I think there's low probability that the that NATO or the U.S. will put boots on the ground in the Ukraine. I think we'll do things to facilitate. Once uh, you know, if right now we have a million refugees have already left the country. It's uh, theorized that another three million will be coming out. You're going to see a lot of support for those in, in Moldova and Poland and Romania, uh, et cetera. But um, I, I think as a counter theory to what, the, the, what you propose there, this could also be a warning from Putin is don't squeeze me too hard on these economic and diplomatic things. You know, this is going to follow out. I'm committed to certain goals here in Ukraine, and, and they're not exactly clear, but uh, I'm going to continue to do that. And if you start, you know, uh, how much can we squeeze them? We cut off all their oil, we cut off everything. 
Uh, this has been much more uh, drastic than anybody thought. Um, at what point is he going to then say, well, I still have one tool left in my, uh, on my belt here. So, uh, you know, he, and, and that's real, the real risk. Uh, I don't, I don't think he thinks he's, you know, how is it, uh, it's going to get messy in Ukraine. They're going to resist. Um, you know, I've, I've no doubt that uh, he'll, he'll take over the cities. Uh, but as we saw in, in Iraq, if you have a population that has insurgency running throughout it, um, you know, the Russians experienced it in Afghanistan, uh, and, um, you know, it's the same. And uh, there, it's very difficult. You can take territory, but uh, you can't hold it. You can't really occupy it. Uh, and it's very costly. And um, so this is really a wrong move for Putin because his economy and uh, diplomatically, the, this Russian empire he's trying to recreate, difficult to see how it moves forward. Yeah, um, and there have been interesting reports. Let me just mention a couple. Um, of course, uh, his economy uh, is suffering and will suffer more. I mean, it's a long, it's a momentum thing. And within a few weeks, it'll start to take hold. And, you know, he'll have a problem, not only in terms of the economy de facto, but in terms of people's reaction. And those body bags are going to come back now to Russia and people aren't going to like it. They don't like it already. And so he's going to have a certain amount of resistance. At the same time, you talk about insurgency. There was an interesting report this morning um, of uh, some, I think, uh, um, Vlad Vladimir, you know, uh, uh, Zelensky. Yeah, he, uh, Zelensky said uh, that um, he he had given permission for some sixteen thousand people right. uh, who want who volunteered from the outside uh, to to fight. Uh, in in Ukraine, and I and I think that's only the top of the iceberg. There'll be more. It's very appealing to fight for the right, um, and they're volunteers. It's it's not like they're you know. Um, there were some. I saw a uh, actually saw online some application forms for that. You fill it out and uh, uh, you send it into the Ukrainian embassy in Washington. Uh, they they have a list of things you should bring with you. Uh, you know, uh, bulletproof vests and and this kind of boots, etc. This is all. It reminds me a little bit of the Spanish Civil War. Yes. When you had the Lincoln Brigade and you had all these other uh, outside forces coming in. Yes, I, and it's very interesting that the people who might volunteer for that uh, could be retired military uh, from U.S. U.S. military uh, to go over there. <laughs> no, either, either am I. <laughs> I didn't ask, <laughs> but it is a question. So, I mean, we're going to get involved in this one way or the other on the ground, and uh, we're going to provide them, you know, weapons and, and, and food and clothing and whatever we can. And I think that's all totally appropriate. And it doesn't it doesn't challenge uh, uh, Putin, you know, uh, in his essential strategy, it, it just helps on the humanitarian level. But there's going to be a new, there's clearly going to be a new status quo. We'll have 4 million refugees to deal with in those countries, which are already suffering inflation and, and uh, you know, from the refugees from Syria a couple of years ago. Uh, and we're also going to have now, uh, Russia will be directly up against the NATO countries. You know, the Ukrainian, the border is directly up against Poland. And, um, you know, so there's how much how much further is he going to go? He is trying to establish a, a circle of buffer countries around him, Georgia, um, Nagorni, Kartabak, and then also uh, now Ukraine, Belarus. You know, one thing that strikes me I'd like to ask you about is this. Um, you know, Ukraine has never attacked Russia. It's always Russia attacking Ukraine. Um, and, and the U.S. has never, you know, they may have uh, uh, accepted the invitations, rather the applications of a variety of Eastern European countries to come into NATO. Um, but that's only membership. Uh, that's not uh, aggressive you know, policy. It's not aggressive military moves. It is simply membership in a in a you know community defense. That's all it is. 
And yeah. so, you know, people say, oh, this is uh, the fault of the U.S. This threatens Putin. And we understand why he's doing this. But I don't I don't understand that at all. Uh, I see only one side here taking aggressive steps. And I wonder if I'm missing something. Could it be that the United States has been aggressive in some way? Could it be that the expansion of NATO is is uh, such an aggressive move in terms of you know, military and defense policy that he should be concerned? Or is it all, you know, silly? Um, it, it strikes me that the United States is, is a def- right now and for a long time is a defensive company, country. It's, it is not interested in taking over new territories. It is not interested in taking aggressive steps or invasions against anyone. Um, and, uh, and here we're, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with somebody who does exactly that. Uh, why, why, what are your thoughts about that? I don't think we're, we're being aggressive in Ukraine. I don't think we're at least uh, in any way interested in, in, in putting any boots on the ground there. I think this stems back from the late nineties with this uh, Budapest memorandum in which um, in order to get Ukraine to give up the nuclear weapons that they had left over from the old Soviet Union, um, we said that we would guarantee their territorial integrity. Russia also signed that. Uh, and that's what this kind of all goes back to. So here, their territorial integrity has been violated by one of the signatories to this uh, memo. Um, and uh, you're right, we're not, I, I do not see there's any aggression on our part. The, the, we got involved in this in the first place for the right reason to get nuclear weapons out of Ukraine, less nuclear weapons that close. And uh, that was accomplished. uh, But in a way that has led the Ukrainians on to think, uh, and they're naturally more oriented in in being aligned with Europe and the EU than they are with uh, Russia um, and be more of a global trading place. They've, they've sold their IT. I read, uh, an article where the, the actual percentage of, uh, um, uh, imports to foreign countries is now China is actually as more, uh, Ukrainian imports than Russia. And then yes, Russia- I saw, I saw that too. Yeah. So I guess the, the larger question is, uh, and so Ukraine would never attack Russia. Ukraine doesn't want nuclear weapons. I mean, it's, it's absurd. And now this fellow is uh, he's making a parking lot out of Ukraine and killing people left and right uh, for reasons that are really hard to understand from, you know, a casual observer and the public all over the world. And so I, I, it's hard to predict, isn't it, uh, you know, where this is going. It's hard to predict what's going to happen next week. It's hard to predict how this is going to settle if it ever settles. Uh, it's hard to predict how it's going to change the face of Europe. But query, how does it change the face of United States defense? How does it change the face of, um, you know, the Marine Corps and its presence hither and yon? You mentioned that the Marine Corps is not in Europe right now, but it could be. Um, and maybe we have to think more globally about, um, you know, deploying our assets. How does this change that that deployment? Well, I think that, um, you know, there are Marines in Europe, of course. We used to have routine deployments in the Mediterranean. Uh, we, we pulled back on those. Uh, we, we didn't do those. Uh, now we'll, we'll start thinking about how those will start happening again. But I think right now what you're seeing is the Army is going to be given the European focus. It's their traditional theater. They have, uh, I think it's on the order of 7,000 troops they put into various countries there. Uh, and let the Marines focus on the Pacific. The Army recently, in recent years, has shown greater interest in the Pacific and is oriented. It has a, um, um, you know, a Pacific uh, uh, focus that is done on that. But I think now that the country, you know, we have to focus on two theaters now. And I think that will be divided between the Army and the Marines. The Army will still clearly be, um, it's so much larger than the Marine Corps, and it will still clearly have uh, a Pacific uh, emphasis, but the, the, our main focus must be Europe. Yeah. You know, we've talked to a number of people in Europe over the past few days, uh, you know, correspondents and people who either have been in, in Ukraine or are in Ukraine. We've had some shows just like the cable, <coughs> the cable TV is that. And um, one thing seems clear. 
They are delighted with President Biden. They are delighted with the presence of, of the US in Western Europe. They are delighted with our interest and our support in all the ways we're supporting them. So to the extent that in the last administration, um, you know, we undermined our relationship with NATO and the EU, which we did on a regular basis, that, that has been, that has changed. And now uh, we, we are returning to a time when the Europeans, by and large, love to hear about America. Um, they love us for what we have done, even in the recent weeks. And I, you know, that's very, you know, that's, that's very encouraging uh, that we're back. We're really back. And that will last a long time, don't you think? Absolutely. We, the, um, well, the, the, the importance of NATO and the importance of uh, collective uh, security uh, is, is very clear. Um, you know, one of the other takeaways here is it's not always got to be uh, with arms. This whole economic, uh, the sanctions, the diplomatic, these countries have all moved relatively quickly, uh, very fast. Uh, Germany has changed uh, within two or three weeks uh, its attitude uh, toward now. It's, it seems to be all in. Uh, and um, and that is, a, that is something that getting back to that, to have this uh, tighter in there, I do think that uh, we, um, we did some damage in the last administration. We, we in a way, uh, with the NATO, I think it, uh, we undermined it. Uh, to what extent did that um, motivate Putin to become mm. more aggressive? Mm. You have to think about that. Um, but it's clear we're going to go back to uh, stronger NATO. Uh, we've, we stress tested our quick reaction forces. I think they're going to have to make some adjustments there. And you're going to start seeing, um, you know, increased defense spending, not only by the U.S., but by those countries. What is it they're going to buy? Uh, that's going to have an impact on the U.S. too. Now, uh, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> they're jets. We sell jets. We sell missiles. Um, and, I, and they're going to buy those. And the... Um, so, well, what yeah. we do, it's clear, it's clear that what we do has an effect on other countries, yeah. other potentially aggressive countries. What we do is it helps to maintain the world order, the liberal world order. And if we're active and moral about it, um, we will maintain the world order. Uh, if we turn our backs on it, then, the, then this will happen. And so, um, you know, I totally agree that... Uh, our participation, our lack of participation in the last few years encouraged uh, Putin. Um, our participation now is going to show him a new way. And all of that is going to show the Chinese that that we're here. But we're going to, you know, another interesting thing is uh, we don't really have a NATO here in the Pacific. We have alliances, a lot of bilateral alliances. We have this uh, ANCUS, which is this new arrangement between Australia, UK and the U.S., um, where we're now uh, getting Australia to uh, be nuclear, have nuclear capability. Um, so how would it, how would this change? If you think about how would these events, if China turned it and was going to do something similar in Taiwan, uh, how could we pull together the rest of Asia and the, and the Western Pacific to coerce China? Would we be as effective? So I do think that you're going to see heightened activity here to pull the countries of Asia together uh, and start so that, you know, get towards this idea of collective security. That's what we need. Absolutely. And we're learning lessons <laughs> on a daily basis about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emo. Um, Emerson Gardner, Lieutenant General, Marine Corps, uh, retired. Thank you so much for joining us today on, on the military in Hawaii. There's much more to discuss, and I hope we can circle back with you soon. Okay. Thanks very much, Jay. Aloha.